So we spent some time talking about work, and now we're going to talk more specifically about energy. And so important words to think about as we continue, and they're going to keep coming up, are system, okay, and potential energy. So these are new words we're going to be discussing quite a bit, and we're going to add them to the words that we already know, such as work, okay? And so we're going to talk about the relationship between these three things. <clears throat> okay, so a system is basically a group of objects that we define, and we can kind of define them by drawing a circle around them. And we can have something where that's a closed system, like this right here, where the total energy of the system will stay the same always. And then we have something that's an open system where energy can enter and leave the system. Okay, so let's start with an apple. Okay, and so this is relevant because Newton kind of started his. This, he, there's always the rumors about Newton and the apple falling from the tree. And so there's an apple sitting in the tree, and it's attached by a stem. And so if the apple falls, or if, if the stem breaks, the apple's going to fall down. Okay, and gravity's going to do work on it and that work's going to cause the energy of this apple to change, okay? But if we want to treat the apple, if we, if we want to take a different approach at looking at this apple, we can actually define the apple and the earth as a system. So the reason that the energy of the apple changes is because it's in Earth's gravitational field, and Earth pulls it downward, okay? And so what that means is it has energy because it's near the earth. And um, if we say that the apple and the earth are a system of their own, so if our earth is the apple and the, if our system is the apple and the earth, then the <clears throat> instead of saying that the earth did work on the apple to cause its speed to change, we could say, well, the apple has energy because it's near the earth. Okay, so if you think about a system like this, if you lift something up, you're giving it energy in the sense that you're moving it away from the earth, and the further away it is, the farther it has to fall, which means the faster it's going to be going when it comes down. And that means it has more energy. And so we call that potential energy. Okay, and so in this case, what it means is that this apple is going to have what's called gravitational potential energy because of the fact that it's in proximity to the earth okay if it was resting on the earth then it wouldn't have that gravitational potential energy anymore but as you lift it away it's going to start to increase that energy okay and so um, what happens is when we do work on something if it's in some in if it's in a position where it's being affected by a force that we'll call a conservative force, like Earth gravity, then doing work we can actually change the potential energy. And so work is equal to the negative change in potential energy. The symbol for potential energy is a capital U. And what this means is this. If gravity is doing work on this apple, then the force of gravity is pulling it down and it's causing its speed to increase. So work is being done, but the potential energy of the apple is, chain, is decreasing because as the apple gets closer and closer to Earth, it doesn't have the potential to speed up or as much of that potential to speed up anymore until it gets to zero when it's on the ground. And the opposite happens when I raise the apple up. Gravity is doing negative work on it because gravity pulls down and it's moving upward. And if gravity does negative work, that means a positive change in potential energy. When I raise it up, the potential energy increases. Okay? And so <clears throat> we already did the calculations and found that gravitational potential energy is equal to the mass times the strength of gravity times the change in height. And so this is our potential energy, or our gravitational potential energy equation. And using this, we can make predictions about how something is going to behave, okay? And as we go down this road with energy, 
a lot of stuff that we've done so far we can answer using questions of energy. Um, there are some qu things that we can answer using energy that we can't answer using things like kinematics and Newton's laws. There is a trade-off though. So remember that work is equal to the dot product of force and displacement. Well when we take the dot product what we're doing is we're taking two vectors and we're turning them into a scalar. Okay, and so energy, the units of energy are joules. Whenever we're talking about energy, the units are in joules and the quantities for energy are scalars. And so while we can do lots of really interesting analysis using energy, we can't use, we can't use it to find the direction of things. And so that information gets lost when we start using energy to analyze a scenario. And so that's kind of the trade-off here, okay? So important things for us to know, though, is that work is equal to the negative change of potential energy, okay? A system is defined as all the objects that we're observing within it, and in a closed system, that energy is conserved, okay? So here in this equation, here's gravitational potential energy. We will need to know that, too. So now I'll show you a couple examples of how this might be relevant to us. So here we have a scenario where there's somebody writing down a slide and we want to know what their velocity is when they get to the bottom. Okay, and let's assume that they're starting from us. So this is a question that we actually can't answer using kinematics because of all this changing direction, changing direction, and then it'll get to the end. <clears throat> okay, or at least if we were to answer this using kinematics, we would need to know a lot of information about the slide. Okay? but we can answer this question using energy, okay? And as I do this, I'm gonna kinda of show you some of the approaches I take when modeling energy, okay? Those of you that had physics before have used LOL charts, and that's basically what we're gonna use here, um, but we're not gonna pay as close attention to the, um, to the um, system diagrams, okay? But we will define the system. So in this system, we have a person and their height is changing relative to the earth. So we would define our system as the person and the earth. Okay, and then we're going to decide whether the system is open or closed. So is, the question would be is if the energy of the system is conserved. Okay, and the rule is that in a closed system energy is conserved, in an open system it is not. And so the reason that a system might be open is if there's something like friction, as you rub against the slide, some of that energy is lost to thermal energy. Okay, because friction can do work and take energy away. So <clears throat> if we assume the slide is frictionless, then we can say that this is a closed system. Okay, and then we can think about the energies going on. So I, the thing I liked about LOL charts is that they allow us to make bar charts and to kind of quantify or at least like qualitatively not quantify but kind of come up with a qualitative comparison of the energies involved and so if this person is up in the air that means they have gravitational potential energy so I'm going to say they have some amount of gravitational potential energy this is totally arbitrary number of boxes here and we're going to say that their kinetic energy is zero because they're not moving yet Okay, and then as they slide down, that kinetic energy is going to, and so here's what we'll do. I don't need us to fill out the O. It's a closed system, and I just don't think that's as relevant here. I guess what when those will be relevant is if we have an open system. Okay, so this would be before at the top, and then after when we get to the bottom, all of that gravitational potential energy as they slide down is being transformed into kinetic energy. And so now all of a sudden, they have all this kinetic energy, they're moving very fast, okay? <clears throat> so I can use this though as a tool to write an equation. I can say we started with gravitational potential energy, mgh. I have zero kinetic energy. At the end, I have zero gravitational potential energy, but I have kinetic energy one half times m times v squared. And so now I can solve this. I can say, okay, well, the, the mass of this person looks like it's irrelevant, so that's gonna drop out. 
and v is going to end up being equal to the square root of 2 times g times h. Okay, and if we plug those values in, we're going to get 8.5 times 10 is 85, times 2 is 170, and the square root of 170 is going to be about 13 meters per second. Okay, so the velocity of this person, we can get to the bottom of the slide, 13 meters per second. Okay, so here we have a roller coaster, and it's got a cart on it. And we'll say this cart has a mass of 300 kilograms. Okay, and it's on a 20 meter hill, and it's going to roll down to ground level. And it's going to roll back up. It's going to roll down to ground level. It's going to roll back up. And so we want to analyze this situation using energy <clears throat> and kind of figure out how fast it's going at the bottom here and at the top of these hills, okay? So the first thing I'd like to do is start by drawing some charts. So let's say that it's initially at rest here. It's gonna start rolling down. So at position A, all it has is gravitational potential energy. Let's say it has five boxes of gravitational potential energy for A, okay? Then it's gonna to go to position B, and what's gonna to happen to that potential energy? Well, it's, not, it's going to be entirely transformed into kinetic energy. So now at this point, we have five boxes of kinetic energy. So if you can imagine that roller coaster, it's going really fast here, speeding up the whole way. And then it's going to start climbing this next hill. And as it goes up that hill, what's going to happen to its kinetic energy? Well, some of it's going to be transformed back into potential energy. So maybe we have like three of these boxes two boxes of potential energy and then or I have six here let's do that let's say there's six if it's half the distance it would have half the potential energy so that makes sense and then it gets to position D and at position D all that gravitational potential energy has been transformed back into kinetic energy so we have one two three four five so six boxes of that and then at position E, what's going to be there? Well, we'll have a little bit of potential energy, maybe like one or two boxes. And then the rest will be kinetic energy. Okay. And so you can see that as it's lower to the ground, it gets faster because it has more kinetic energy. And so we can use this to figure out the velocity at any point. We can say at A, we have mgh at b we have one half mv squared so this represents situation a this represents b and d right because at both those situations you have all kinetic energy <clears throat> we also have at c some gravitational potential energy and some kinetic energy and in this case h is equal to 10 and then at B, or at, sorry, at E, we have a different amount of gravitational potential energy and a different amount of kinetic energy. Okay, and so we can use this to solve for the velocity at any point. Okay, and I'll just do it for maybe two of them. Let's say, to see how fast it's going at point C, we could say, okay, so MGH at A is equal to mgh plus one half mv squared at c okay and now we can solve this h is 20 this h is 10 and we can solve this for v okay go ahead and solve this for v so here we get that the velocity is 14 meters per second okay i'd like for you now to go ahead and solve for the velocity at point e okay we find out that here it's going 17 meters per second. Okay, and so we'll go ahead and wrap up this video here. We'll do a little bit more energy stuff on the next video.